Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Cullum Flynn podcast coming to you from the Eternal City. The Eternal City being Rome in Italy. It is uh, great to have your company. Thank you so much for downloading the podcast, for giving it a listen. And I hope it's nice where you are. Here in Italy, over the past number of days, they've just been putting up the Christmas lights all across Rome now, over the streets, outside the shops. So the whole city is sparkling and it's twinkling, so it's really beautiful. Getting a bit cold, that's the only thing. And Rome is famous for sitting outside. You can sit outside the restaurants, have your bowl of pasta, your glass of vino. And normally during the spring and the summer, that is beautiful, but... Now when it gets a bit colder, it's a bit tricky, but if you want to sit out, if you're coming to visit Rome at this time of the year, you can sit outside most of the restaurants because they've put up the heaters and you can sit under those Christmas lights and a lot of them have those big blankets you can wrap around you when you can have your glass of wine and you can people watch and it's great. Ah, it's so beautiful. And I'm right beside the Vatican. The Christmas tree has just gone up in front of the Vatican. Each year they bring the Christmas tree from a different part of the world. So a country or um, a region would donate the tree and it's hugely symbolic. Last year it was Slovenia and the height of the tree represented the number of years of Slovenian independence and so on and so forth. So this year the tree has come from the north of Italy and it has been decorated by the homeless and refugees. So it is covered in these beautiful wooden decorations and they've all been they've been made. The decorations were made by people who are refugees, who are homeless, the people on the margins. Who are the people that Pope Francis has always reached out to since he became Pope back in 2013? Oh, it's good. Lots. Of, there's so much I want to talk to you about. I was in Greece recently in Cyprus. We were doing some videos. Uh, loads of great things going on. But... This podcast is all about talking to people who are far more interesting than I am, which wouldn't be hard. And today's guest really fits that bill. Her name is Sanya Ruggiero. Now, Sanya Ruggiero, Italian name, but she doesn't live in Italy. She lives thousands and thousands and thousands of kilometers from where I am sitting now in Rome. She lives kind of on the edge of the world, on the Fiji Islands, off the coast of Australia in the Pacific Ocean. So I have been following Sanya for a long time on social media, looking at her tweets, following her stuff on Facebook, and I've always really admired the work that she does. I've been really impressed by everything that she does. She is a consultant, freelance consultant, does a lot of work with the United Nations across many different departments. She works for the Food Authority, which is based here in Rome. And now at the moment, she is working on COVID response, a a package that helps businesses and people affected by COVID across the Fiji Islands and neighboring islands. She also co-produces pieces for television on Australian TV. And she is also working on a program at the moment with the government in the Marshall Islands, trying to get compensation from the United States to clean up the radioactivity that has been left left over after they did their nuclear testing on the Marshall Islands in the 50s, if I'm not mistaken, the 40s, 50s, 60s. So just so much going on, a strong woman of faith as well. So I asked her if she would be kind enough to come on the podcast and just talk to me about her life, her family story, how the family ended up from Italy to the Fiji Islands, the work she's doing now, her kind of take on different things. And even though there's a huge time difference because she is way out in the Fiji Islands, she kindly agreed. So we recorded the podcast very early my time in the morning and very late her time. So here it is. Without further ado, I give you Sanya Ruggiero. I want to give the listeners a little glimpse behind the scene because they're listening to us. I have the privilege of being able to see you and look at you on the screen and you are holding your iPhone, you have a pink sock over the iPhone, the top of it, and that is how we're recording this interview. Exactly, exactly. You know, we we have to be resourceful, right? We were not, and this is the second time that we've attempted this, because the first time we, we just didn't, we didn't succeed because of the internet on my side. So is this common? And you're taking a big slug of tea, I like that, a nice Egyptian mug. Yeah. Is this common in Fiji that the internet is kind of patchy? Yeah, the, I mean, it is common. Um, but the thing of it is, is that Fiji is is luckier. 
um, than than most of the other Pacific Island countries around us. We have a pretty robust. Um, you know, internet connectivity and telecommunication system over here, which is one of the reasons why Fiji is known as as kind of the hub um, of the South Pacific, which is where Fiji is located. But if you go to some of our neighboring countries, so we have, for example, um, Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands and, and Tonga, and then much smaller atoll nations like um, Kiribati, for example, um, you know, the, the internet connectivity is so, so hard there. And and we'll probably touch on it maybe later on in this in this conversation, but that is one of the major challenges to to development and, and to so many other things um progressing um in some of these countries. Now Sanya, most people when you talk to them about the Fiji Islands, of course they've heard of it. If you ask them to point to it on a map, they'd more than likely say somewhere there around Australia. So give us kind of the geography 101. Fiji, where is it? Population, a little bit of the history, and then we'll then we'll get to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, actually this is probably even this is super interesting, but so so Fiji, the Fiji Islands, you know, like a lot of people in the United States for example, um have heard of Fiji because of Fiji water. Um, you see it at, you know, the Oscars and, you know, you see it in movies and, and the Kardashians are, you know, famous for saying, like, we only drink Fiji water. Um, not in that accent, but but along those lines. Um, and and it's always funny to me because people are like, oh, my God, I thought Fiji was just the brand of this water. I didn't realize it was an actual country. Um, but no, no, it, it is an actual country. So the Fiji Islands um, only about 850,000 people. So very small. It's it's less than a million in population, but it is made up of 300 islands. Now, the majority of those islands are uninhabited. Mm. Located in the South Pacific, like I said, so so the Pacific Ocean, the largest ocean in the world, um, we're in the South Pacific, and like I said, very close to our other South Pacific neighbors of Tonga, Vanuatu, the Solomon Islands. Um, But in terms of much larger countries, we're about four and a half hours by plane away from Australia and about three and a half hours away from New Zealand. Wow. It was created tens of thousands of years ago um, by volcanic eruptions. So all of the islands have been created by, you know, underwater volcanic eruptions, as is most of the Pacific. And they believe that it started becoming inhabited by these oceanic civilizations um, as far back as around, you know, around 20,000 years ago. So even though there may have not have been settlement at that time, but there's a, a civilization called the Lapita people. Um, and and they're very famous um, for they, they no longer exist in terms of the actual name, but they are modern day Polynesians. Um, very famous. I could go on as I, I I'm a huge fan. I'm, I love history, so you know this question we could probably talk about it for a really long time. I've heard that said before, Sanya, about the sheer number of islands. Like when people talk about Indonesia, they say, "Oh, two thousand islands." So when you're looking at Fiji in a collection of 300 islands, does that mean they're just like a, a lump of rock sticking out of the ocean? Or are we actually looking at 300 large, beautiful islands scattered out across the ocean? Yeah, good good question. So Thank you. like I said, because all of these are a result Thank of vul- volcanic eruptions um, over you know thousands of years, you do have a lot of as you termed them, just these rocks sticking sticking out of the ocean. But not all of them are. And there's, you know, there are hundreds that are white sandy beaches and beautiful green vegetation and literally like, you know, a private, it, it would be a private beach. Um, now, the reason which I believe, you know, many people ask the question, why are they uninhabited then? Um, okay, so... First of all, I mean, the population is only 850,000. However, that would not be the main reason. The main reason is already in the two largest islands of Fiji. So one where I currently am, Viti Levu, that's that's where we have the capital, Suva. Um, 
you know, already there are huge challenges presented. We've already, we're already experiencing one of them in terms of internet connectivity, right? So the topography and the geography basically of this country with its huge mountains and valleys and, and ranges and set all the way out here, you know, very, very remote in terms of the rest of the world, um, present these enormous geo- these enormous logistical challenges to having, you know, proper running town or, or you know, getting good, base, even basic services out there, you know, like running water and electricity and things like that. It, it's just, it's just non-viable at the moment. It sounds like a tropical paradise. I'm surprised that the population is still so low. You would think that people would be just rushing to get there and live there, especially on the larger islands where you have some uh, facilities like schools and hospitals and roads and the internet. Um, Why is the population still quite low? Yeah, I mean, you know, Fiji is all of those things. It is, um, and and perhaps I am a bit biased, but I'd I'd hope not because... um, it's it's a tropical paradise for sure. And we have, prior to COVID, we had around 60,000 tourists a month, per month, coming into the country. Now, for a country as small as ours, you know, that's major. Um, and, it's, and it was the major driving uh, force of, it, you know, our, our biggest um, earner. Um, it was the driving force behind the country's GDP and things like that. Um, and also, we have so many celebrities that that own private islands here, so or or come in even if it's just for for a trip. So yesterday we had the actress Rebel Wilson arrive in country, um, but we have people like Richard Branson who own an island here. And this is this is going to sound so bad because I can't remember his name, but the the guy that owns like Red Bull, he has a private island here. And Mel Gibson, the actor. So these are just a few of the ones I know. Um, and every year we have so many celebrities come in and, and things like that. It, it, it is one of the most developed countries in the region for sure. Um, but it's not, it, it's not at the stage to be able to, to sustain an extremely large population. Um, and very secretly, just between you and I, I really hope it stays that yeah, way. Yeah, of course, of course. You have it all to yourself. And Sanya, how does it run? Are you looking at a, a king, a government, a prime minister, a president? Before missionaries arrived in the country in the 1800s, um, the Fijian system was was run by tribal chiefs. And you have, you know, villages thousands of villages all across the country, all with, you know, their own unique traditions, their own um, complete systems of, of governance within those villages. And it ran so well. I, it, it ran very, very well um, for all that time. So then the missionaries um, arrived, um, brought Christianity, and, and like many other countries, Things began to change in terms of governance. Uh, the country was now under the rule of the Queen of, of England. Um, and in 1970, on the 10th of October, um, Fiji gained independence um, from the British Crown and now has a system of you have a prime minister and a president um, and, and a parliamentary system, cabinet, all of that. And like in Australia, where they have the indigenous people and, you know, in America, they have the the Native Americans. Do they have some sort of struggle there between the indigenous people of the of the land of the Fiji Islands and the the people who currently rule it? Not at all. Not at all. The the indigenous people are the leaders of this country. So so they are the majority population. Um, The prime minister is indigenous the newly uh, coming in president, indigenous, it's, it's always been um, like that right from, right from the beginning. So right on from the handing over of, uh, from the British to the Fijians, it's always been um, this way. So no, it's not the same struggle uh, that you see in, in Australia, even in New Zealand. Wow. I want to talk to you more in a minute about the big issues in Fiji at the moment. I know climate change is affecting you 
really quite uh, starkly there because you're on the front lines. But about, about you, I know you're working um, part time or freelance with the UN and you do lots of other interesting projects. But you were born that four hour flight away in Sydney, Australia. What made you and your family leave Australia and moved to Fiji in the first place? Um, so my family was already living in Fiji and we're kind of there in, in Australia and in Sydney for, you know, just a bit of a short, sort of some short term work um, and then returned to Fiji. I, my parents said, you know, uh, we knew um, that if whenever we had children, we'd want to raise them in Fiji. It's, it's, it's fantastic for, you know, for family, for raising a family and, um, the easy pace island lifestyle, I think, that you would find in many other um, island countries as well, like in the Caribbeans and, and, and such. Um, so they, were, they knew that they were coming back to Fiji. Um, but of course, you know, my, my grandparents and, and things um, are, are Italian. And, and that's quite an interesting story of, of how they got to Fiji, because that's very far away. We talked about this when we were doing our pre-interview interview, and you were telling me that your, was it your grandfather? He, he kind of moved around a bit and he would yeah. run from one place to the next. And <laughs> why was that? Explain what happened. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, Colin, um, strap yourself in for a ride. Okay. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. I'm going to give the very condensed version. Okay, I'm buckled up. I'm buckled up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, my my grandfather, uh, my dad's <laughs> dad, um, I think probably has the most interesting story and, and is the um, genesis for for this family's life in, in Fiji. Um, so he, my grandfather was from Calabria uh, in, in southern Italy. And, you know, he was born in, in the early 20s and was also conscripted into the war. Um, and he was sort of designated to, um, I, I don't know what the proper term for this is, but to submarine duty. So he was in a submarine for, for about, you know, working in a submarine with, with other colleagues for about eight or nine months. And, and he always said, whenever I spoke to him, he said, oh, I knew from the moment I got there, I am not staying here. This is not where I want to be and I'm not doing this. And so I think for, I'm not sure how helpful he was for the eight or nine months, um, but eventually him and a colleague, a mate on the submarine were like, oh my God, we totally know what to do. Somebody said, if you rub vinegar into your armpits, um, you know, over a couple of days, you can, you can put, get yourself, you know, to have a pretty high temperature and you can feign a really high fever. So why don't we try, try it? Because then we'll seem really sick and then they can just send us home. Ah. And so they did it um, and it worked. They got sent to, uh, you know, an, a, to a hospital, um, like an army hospital on back, back on shore. And here are where the details become sketchy. But, but my grandfather, Giuseppe, um, and, and his friend managed to go home and did not have to, they were like, oh, they've got a really high fever. Maybe they need a little time off. So in that little time off, my grandfather packed whatever little suitcase he had and fled to Albania, um, left behind his family, left behind his parents wow. and just fled. And he would have been, you know, yeah, not like probably late teens, 20 at max. Goes to Albania and he just did you know, odds and ends there, worked for an engineer. Now, I don't know why, but he, somebody then talked to him and said, you know what, there's so many Italians um, going over to Brazil and it's a great life there. Um, and you're, you know, you're working really hard here. Go over there. You can make your fortune. Somewhere in that time, he married and, and then fled to Brazil. Um, now, this might be another interesting point over here because Brazil is fantastic and he has three children there, um, and life is great. Um, he opens a factory there, like an engineering um, place, and, and hires a couple of people. Things are looking really up for this, you know, uneducated kid from the south of Italy. And then things kind of take a downward spiral, and it's not going so great. Um, there's a lot of people that haven't paid him, um, there's a lot of, you know, things are just not good financially. The family gets enough money 
and then flees Brazil uh, for Australia. And somebody said you'd have a better life there. Now, when you say flee, why do you keep using the word flee? Because he, f- he fled Albania to Brazil. Now you're saying he fled Brazil and went to Australia. Yeah. Was this guy also on the side involved in something maybe he shouldn't have been? <laughs> you like know, just between you and me, of course. Of I would never course. tell anyone. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> these, these tapes just make their way to like the Italian police or something and he's on a wanted list. Um, so, okay, so in the, in the version of the story that I have been told, I have to admit, he he never used the word flee or fled <laughs> with me. He just said, for legal reasons, <laughs> I had to leave very quickly. <laughs> That's it. The, now, you can interpret <laughs> that as you will, but tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., I pick up everything and I leave. I'm just departing swiftly. That is Spot on, right on the money column. You said it better than than I could. <laughs> That's exactly it. There was always this sense of urgency. Um, and, oh, yeah, we just had to, we only had like 24 hours to leave the country or stuff. And it's, it's like, hmm. But your dad was born in Brazil, yeah. wasn't he? Your dad was born there and then he fled with, the, with his uh, son, your dad, and then they came to Australia. Correct. And then you, I, I thought you were born in Sydney. Were you born in Sydney or you were born in actually in Fiji? No, in Sydney. In Sydney. So you were born in Sydney and then you fled <laughs> to Fiji. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, 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 I was under the age of of one. But isn't it amazing, Sanya, your family history, when you look at the geography of how they moved across the world from, you know, from west to east in the extremist form, they went from Brazil over to or uh, no, Albania first, then Brazil. So I suppose they went uh, east to west and west right back over to east to Australia. And now you're way out there uh, in the, on the Fiji Islands. It's incredible. Your family has, in a short period of time, just over a few generations, traversed the face of the globe. That is so true. That is so true. It, it, it is remarkable. And and in many ways, it's changed completely the the family, right? Even even the family as a whole. So, you know, where nobody within my, you know, immediate family has grown up in Italy or anything like that. Of course, I have extended family that is still there. And it's, it's, it's always, it always, you know, it's so remarkable how a few decisions that at the time may not have seemed so huge to him. You know, I, I'm sure at many points he thought, ah, someday I'm going to go back there. I'll see mum and dad again. I'll, you know, I'll see these guys again and stuff. Um, but he didn't. He didn't. And it's these little decisions that we make in life that just completely uh, change the face of, of families, communities. It's fascinating. I think about that often. Even every day, the small things you do, a decision that you make could alter the course of your life without you realizing it. Like, oh, today I think I will sit in this cafe and not the one that I normally go to. And then you meet somebody and they become someone you date. And then, or someone which often and has happened for uh, generations now in Ireland, people say, I'm going to go to England or to the States and work for a summer or work for a while. And then you meet someone over there, you settle down and then your life has changed course completely and you're on the other side of the world. And then it's just fascinating, isn't it? But it's a, it's a great story. And the result of it is that we're here talking today. I'm sitting in Rome looking at you and you were sitting on, in the Fiji Islands looking back at me. So your life is good today. You're happy. Oh, life is life is extremely, um, extremely good. I'm I'm very grateful for everything. I've been given, you know, a lot of opportunities in life, um, thanks to God. And uh, and you know, I I, I have more importantly um, been given, you know, many opportunities to try to help other people, um, kind of move into a better life. Now, before we talk about that very quickly, just to finish that story. So your grandfather sadly has passed away, but I know your parents are still alive and your dad was um, a diplomat. He was an ambassador. Is that right? Um, he, so so when my, my grandfather eventually arrived in, in Fiji, 
um, I guess, you know, at some point the Italian government were like, oh, okay, well, there's an Italian there, you know, probably make him the Italian consular to Fiji in case any other Italians go there. Um, and which they did, which they did. And, um, and, and because after he passed on, it kind of just moved on to my dad. But um, when you are, you know, like, for example, an, an Italian or any other uh, consular, you're not sort of an ambassador. It's just one of the things that you do apart from your your day job as well. Now, I might cut this out afterwards if you don't uh, want me to ask it, but was he a bit of a, was he a wise man? Your grandfather? <laughs> he, had, he had a lot of wisdom, um, if that's the question. <laughs> Like he he just landed he he landed in Fiji and the Italian government just made him a diplomat, a consulate, just like that. This is sounding so dodge, isn't it? I love it. He had connections. I know, but you're gonna laugh at this. But my my dad plays the piano uh, very well. He you know he he used to go to classes you know from when he was very young. He was forced to go, um, but it made it, it gave him a skill, right? And he was like, Sonia, you are gonna learn to play the piano. And the very first song, and I remember my <laughs> my mom being like, could you start with something a little more simple, please? Because the very first thing he wanted to teach me on the piano um, was the uh, famous uh, soundtrack, the, the main song to the Godfather movies trilogy. Oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Here we so, go. So my mom's like, yeah, no. Let me ask you this, Sanya. So what does your dad work at? What does he do? Right. So so both my parents um, uh, work in, in in different sort of areas of the of the death and the funeral industry. And <laughs> this is just, <laughs> you know, it's getting oh worse God. and worse. I know where this is just so if I did have something to hide. Look, look at me as I go wink, wink. If I did have some, this is so incriminating, isn't it? But anyway, they, they, um, yeah. they work in the death and the funeral industry. So um, in, in my, my dad um, built the, the country's first um, gas-fired crematorium. And, and my mother, um, wow. yeah, is, is, um, has a, a monument and tombstone business, which is, which is something that, that my family was engaged in back in Calabria. So that's interesting. You know, I have a good friend in New York who is an undertaker and runs a funeral home. It is a passion. It's a vocation for him. He's always said, how did your parents get into the funeral business and opening up the first incinerator there in Fiji? Is, is it a passion for them, a vocation? Yeah, I mean... Like you said, it it really has to be right, and and so I've grown up. Um, it's something, you know. My my dad studied to be an engineer in in the United States, and and he, you know, came back to Fiji then, and and was and was working as an engineer. Um, but he he was very he spoke about this a lot, and he said, you know. Um, we would see, you know, a lot of a lot of funerals happen outdoors for people that wanted a cremation done. The only option was to have, you know, a very traditional uh, funeral pyre. So with, you know, you need to, to get wood um, and do all of that stuff. And, and that's how it's always been here. Um, and he's, he always said, you know, we needed we we need to do something. We need to sort of basically um, enable people to cremate their loved ones with more dignity yeah and and so he opened he built from scratch um himself as he as he was an engineer um this this gasified crematorium and it's actually called dignified uh, cremations so so that was that um and my mother oh wow she is you know she is a force like it's you know her as well. I mean, she studied, you know, journalism and mass communication, and 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 worked in a couple of different countries. And then, you know, she, like I said, the 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 monument and tombstone business is very very common, right, for for Italians uh, to run these. I'm um, especially in in Australia, you have a lot of Italian run monument. Um, businesses. And I think it really does stem this. It, I don't know, like, it's, is it in the blood? Is it in what it's in? But it's like for thousands of years, you know, from the Romans, and then after that, to medieval times, and Italians just 
love crafting these odes to you could you know these these monuments to um, to memorialize um, their loved ones and and it, it really is more than just a job. I mean, I see how seriously she makes sure you know all her staff take this and and she says continuously she said this is something that's going to last a lifetime and it's beautiful because of course every Fiji is a very Christian country and you have um, you know almost every single monument with these beautiful Bible verses um, carved into them and, and things on this beautiful granite and uh, and you and you have the cemeteries here full of these plaques like from these monuments for years and years people have come to her and and it's, it's really something special. It's really something special. So being around the death industry growing up and being involved in it and working in it, it being the family business, what do you think, Asanya, are some of the biggest misconceptions about being an undertaker, a funeral director or working in that business? That, you know, there's, there's quite a few. And I think they, the majority of them come stem from fear. Um, stem from, you know, superstitions, um, fear. And, and I'm, not, I'm not negating in any way people's experiences of this because, of course, a lot of this, you know, we're, we're taught in childhood or it's part of the, this cultural sort of reasoning around death. Um, but it's a, it, it, because it seems so mysterious, there's there's a lot of fear around it, but I would I, I would want to pass on pass on the message that there is very much nothing to be afraid of. There is nothing unclean or impure or anything like that, um, and it is I think an you know an immense act of love to 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 be able to prepare this person for their final journey. Maybe it is. For people, I know you, you're a person of strong faith, as am I, but for people who don't have faith, it is seen as, of course, the final frontier. I mean, this is it. It's curtains down. And death is such an abstract thing for most people. Not, not, not that it's abstract. We know what it is. But we cannot really comprehend dying, not being here tomorrow, not having a next breath or a heartbeat. So we push it aside and we put it to the back of our mind. We ignore it. We see it in Hollywood. It's always someone else who dies, not us. But when you see a body in front of you, and I think this is a great thing about being Irish because they're so good at doing funerals and doing wakes. And I remember even as a kid, when my parents would go to a wake, they would bring us. And a wake is something you would have maybe the night before at the person's house, the person who died. And they would lay out the coffin, open the lid, the body would be there and everyone would go up one by one and look at it. You could put your hand in and touch their hands and you would feel the skin cold and a bit stiff. And that really hits home that someday, you know, that could be you. I saw once on a gravestone, a great saying, and it said, all you good people standing by as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so shall you be. So say a prayer and think of me. And so simple, but so profound and so true. But you're, you're facing this reality every single day. Does it, because you do a faith and you believe in the afterlife that y it's easier for you to handle because you think, well, this isn't the final end. I believe in not to be the final end. It is not only, and, and I speak from the view of of. of Christianity, but I know many religions carry this, but not only are you kind of fortified um, against, you know, sort of being afraid of death, but it, you're, it's even sort of like something to look forward to, right? Everything you read in Catholic tradition, in, in you know, in, you know, the words of the saints and, and, and even the Bible, it's like when you see all these great saints and you believe 100%, um, you know, everything that they went through in their lives, you're like, yeah, you know what, this is this is not the end. And coming back, sorry, but to your original your original question of whether it's faith that that enables me to personally, you know, definitely not have this this fear. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. What do you say to the question that I get asked a lot, and it's a difficult question to answer when people say, "You have just mentioned, Sanya, that people are afraid of death. They're afraid." 
of the notion of dying and passing into the afterlife or there not being an afterlife. It's just such a scary proposition. People try and level with me that, Cullum, do you not see that over time we have developed these systems of religion as a coping mechanism for death and to make it more comfortable? And isn't it an easy thing to believe? Rather than someone saying you're dead, you're gone, lights out, If someone said, well, look, why don't you believe in this, where when you die, it's going to be even better. You'll be out of this veil of tears when you get to the by and by. And who wouldn't want to be part of that? For you, I know we don't have enough time to get into it here. This is such a long conversation. But, you know, how how do you balance that? And how do you know in your heart that it is real and true and not just a coping mechanism and something that gives you comfort? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, what a what a loaded question, right? And one and one that humanity has has constantly had, you know, people grapple with this. And and everything that I'm about to tell you or or it, all the words that I'm about to answer you with, um, obviously, they, they do not come from me. They come from the the enormous the giants of teachers that that have taught us with this faith. One of them being, of course, Mother Angelica, who uh, you would (laughs) know way more than me. I'm uh, the founder of of EWTN um, and and many, many others. I mean, I'm a huge fan, I I, I guess, of um, Fulton Sheen and, and of course, currently in in terms of of people still living at the moment, um, Bishop Robert Barron and and loads of others of of great thinkers. Now, this question of, of is it, isn't that the easy way out? I love this question. Isn't this the easy way? And you can always kind of tell that, that the person is either you know, what if they're speaking to us is, is per, you know, either maybe is a non-believer or, or, or has kind of fallen away from the faith. Because I'll tell you, God, just like Mother Angelica said, it is the hardest choice ever. It is the harder life to anybody that thinks that it is the easiest, <laughs> is the easier way out to choose um, to follow this faith, to follow this doctrine. Um, and to be in this state of love, um, it's a commitment, right? Uh, number one, love is a commitment. Number two, it is the harder uh, decision, in my very humble opinion, but also in the in the opinion of many great saints, to choose to stick by a faith, right? Um, there's there's much that is demanded uh, of you. If in any way I thought that you know what there might not be a God on the other side. There might, no, there, there's a possibility that, that it doesn't, that he doesn't exist, that this doesn't happen. Oh my goodness. You know, I would probably like many people talk, you know, up and go have a list of things that you're ready to uh, explore and um, <laughs> in the world. Right. But that is just not the case. It's very real. Very, very real. Now, if I can give you one point of why I believe, um, apart from from the fact that, you know, I, be, I, I believe in my heart with all my heart. If we just come from the, the very basic premise of humility and we cast our eye back along history, first uh, around 2021 years of history, and then way further back, um, you know, to to the very beginnings of of the greats Abraham um, and and the many that came after him. You know, if I was a person that was sort of contemplating of whether this is true or not, whether whether this faith is true or not, just from the basic premise of humility, I would say to myself, you know, it's been more you know, about five six thousand years of these these people, these highly, highly intelligent people, these deeply contemplative people, giving everything up of the martyrs at the Colosseum, right, 2,000 years ago. Uh, People have, thousands and thousands of people have died. Thousands of generations have come 
like I said, with the most intelligent people and all of them saying the same thing, loving the same God. It is, it's kind of, in my opinion, it's fairly, it would be fairly arrogant for Sanya to sit here personally in 2021 and say, you know what? Yeah, I mean, yeah, they were smart. I know. Listen, I agree with everything else they said. They, read, they wrote a really good book, right? St. Faustina, one of my favorites. Fantastic book. Now, listen, that stuff that she says about, you know, seeing Jesus or any of that, I'm not too sure about that, but certainly a highly intelligent individual. I, yeah, no, that would be really, really, in my opinion, for me knowing the capacity that I have. You're absolutely right. (laughs) Sanya, I couldn't have put it any more eloquently than you have. And it's true, you know, we think sometimes that we are at the stage of enlightenment and there's this attitude today, especially among young people that, well, I know religion has been around, uh, you know, Christianity and the Catholic faith for over 2000 years, other religions for even longer, but they should change to suit me rather than me changing to suit the religion. And earlier this year, when I went with the Pope to Iraq, we visited the home of Abraham there in the Nineveh Plains in Iraq. And incredible to be standing there outside this stone hut and think this is where the three main monotheistic religions were born. And you mentioned those thousands of years of people believing, following it, thinking it through, dedicating their whole lives to thinking about it. And coming back to the same conclusion that, yes, there is a God, the God is real, and more people believe than don't. That is the thing in the world. The people who do not believe in a religion or a faith or a God, they're the minority. But nowadays, you're led to believe that you are the minority and you're the crazy one if you have faith. What's it like for you in Fiji growing up as a young, you know, very attractive woman who has faith? Do you feel that pressure that people feel in the West? Has it reached Fiji? Um, that is that is um, amazing, and and yes, I did follow your trip to uh, Iraq, and and some of the the reports that you did there, Colm, absolutely amazing, and um, and and thank you for that little compliment in between. I got the the attractive as well, but <laughs> in <laughs> in Fiji, um, a very a very um, Christian country. Now we also have, like I described uh, earlier, about fifty percent of the population who you know who are descendants of of the um, indentured laborers that were brought in from India. So you know, just last week there was a public holiday here in Fiji for Diwali, which is a, a Hindu festival. So so you have people from all you know all all religions, all sorts of backgrounds. Um, and we have been very fortunate um, in Fiji, as in many, many other parts of the Pacific, that it is almost the um, it, it, it's almost the opposite. So if you say that you're, you know, not really, you know, uh, somebody that you know believes in God or or or, or has a has a faith, people are like, oh, really? That's interesting. It is really different um, over here in that general sense, right? But you make a fantastic point about young people and this move, uh, this this shift in thinking. I understand why you people might have these beliefs and maybe, maybe there is a God, but I'm not going to talk about it that much. God belongs on Sunday at church or at home with my grandmother but not out anywhere else. You know what I find? A few things. Um, I I always say to people when I'm talking to them, and sometimes from being on TV in Ireland a bit and having covered religious stories over the years, if I would ever talk to someone who knew who I was and they were saying quietly, oh, by the way, I think it's good that you have faith. And uh, I do too, but I don't normally, uh, you know, talk about it that much. And they always say the same thing. Well, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't know too much about it. I can't really defend it. I say, buddy, Look at me. I'm a big dum-dum. I am a dum-dum. I'm not a biblical scholar. I'm not a theologian. (laughs) But today, what do people say? What do people say? The new buzzword, your truth is the truth. Young people should be able to say, look, of course, if you start quizzing me inside out about the mysteries of the Bible and these things that people have been contemplating and trying to figure out for thousands of years, no, I can't explain them all to you. That is why it's called faith. But what I can tell you is I feel something deep down. And then they always say, oh, but Cullum, it's just cultural, isn't it? You say, of course, part of it is cultural. Everything is cultural. 
Everyone is, their, their world is navigated and influenced by their surroundings, you know, in every sense and in every form. But you can just say that really this is something I feel deep down. I have a sense that there is something there more than that there isn't something there. You may think the other way and that's, that's okay. That's fine by you. But it is just as it's crazy today that people are being led to believe that the two, like faith and science and faith and reason cannot be intertwined. Whereas recently we went and did a piece at the Vatican Observatory and the guy who heads the Vatican Observatory here in Italy is a former lecturer and professor from Harvard and MIT, two of the most prestigious learning institutions in the world. He was studying planetary sciences, working with NASA. He left that and he came and joined the Vatican and became the director of the Vatican Observatory. He did a fabulous interview about faith and science going together and how this notion that they're apart is only a, a modern day concept that developed in the 19th century. So I love it when I hear people say, yes, I believe in my faith. I, I Look, I don't understand it fully, but that is why it's a work. You've got to work in it. You've got to keep learning about it. But I have faith in it. And I always make a point when I was in Hungary recently, I saw two people say grace before dinner. Didn't know them in a cafe, didn't know who they were. And when I was going out, I made a point of stopping and saying, by the way, I saw you publicly bless yourself and say grace before meals. That is brilliant. I think people admire other people as well if they stand for something. They may not understand it, agree with it. But if you stand for something, people might laugh and joke and send out a stupid tweet. But I think deep down, they admire it. Oh, you know, 100 percent, 100 percent, Colm. I mean, throughout history, we have seen it is it, it, if there's one one sentence that that I could say and, and uh, you know, in the in the grand scheme of things, I am nobody. But but something that you hear echoed throughout history when it comes to faith is do not be afraid making making it known that yes I, I i do believe god is in control here and and not only do i believe i mean i try to sort of you know channel and and and, and navigate my entire life according because you know what i found colm um like like you mentioned at the beginning i work for the united nations and and what i've found not only when it comes to faith but in almost every single thing in life Everybody is waiting for somebody to kind of take the first, make the first move. Mm. Everybody's trying to find their way in life. Exactly. And you're, you're so right. You should be a leader. Don't be a sheep. Be a leader. And don't go with the flow because the only thing that goes with the flow is a dead fish. Fish that are alive, they swim against the flow upriver. That's it. That is it. Um, and for many people I know, it can feel intimidating, um, speaking about a, out about anything, let alone something like religion, where you very, uh, you know, you put it very well, where you said, you know, they feel like, okay, if I talk about this in any way, I'm going to get ridiculed. You know what? Don't be afraid to be ridiculed. That's uh, you. If you think that you're the only one being ridiculed in life, <laughs> oh, no, that is that is not the truth. Do not be afraid. There'll be a yeah. couple that try to do that. Okay. And, and I can guarantee you that anybody that's talking smack yeah. like that to you, on the inside, there's something not completely right, you know, in life. I don't mean mentally. Please don't get me wrong. I don't mean of mentally. I, I, meant, I, I, I meant in the sense that, you know, yeah. they're looking for something. Yeah. Or maybe. No, of course. Yeah. And I love that expression. S speaking smack. Someone who's speaking smack of you. And that phrase you brought up, do not be afraid Everyone thinks of John Paul II, St. John Paul II, who said that and encouraged all the people in Poland to resist and fight and then started the domino effect that they say brought down the Soviet Union. But the other thing, too, um, Mother Angelica, who you mentioned a while ago, you know, we talk about the cancel culture today. She was experiencing the cancel culture before there was the cancel culture. Here's this nun in Alabama in the Bible Belt, not in a Catholic area, in a Protestant area, decides to start a TV network. Nobody pays any attention. The priests and bishops kind of laugh it off until it becomes big and until it starts being broadcast in neighboring states. And then all of a sudden, you know that little old nun down in Alabama who we laughed at? Her TV network, EWTN, is now on in all 52 states. And we better do something about this. So the bishops tried to cancel her. 
they tried to rip her off the air. They tried to take control of the network and she didn't believe, she didn't trust them that they would be theologically sound and stay true to the faith. And she famously went on TV live on air and she said, I'm going to blow this place up before I hand it over to you, bishops. And then she, the people who were watching were being called conservative Catholics and they were trying to cancel her. So this was cancel culture before social media. And she gave a famous speech at some conference once. And she said, you have nothing to fear. Do not be afraid. You're on the winning team. And just a beautiful speech she gave. But I want to ask you about the UN because I know I've kept you for so long. Uh, you, you talk about faith, you talk about the UN. A lot of people would say those two cannot intertwine that well. How do you find working with the UN in different capacities as a person of faith? Go. <laughs> so, um, you know, so much there to, to say, but that energy of, of uh, Mother Angelica's, um, you know, that's the kind of energy uh, column that, that I think many people uh, that know me within the UN would, would say that I am attempting to channel. And that line there about I will blow this place up before I allow them to do, you know, to, <laughs> to get me off and start this. I think that's a fantastic lesson for, for, for people listening today and, and just for people in general that say, you know what, look, I, I, don't, I, I don't follow um, Catholicism or I left the Catholic Church because look at all of the things that are going wrong within there. Look at all of the, the negative stuff that's happened in there, right? Um, and and actually, I should name it. We should we shouldn't shy away from from it. You know, whether it's whether it's the um, sex abuse scandals or you know corruption or anything like that. And for many people, this is the reason that they've fallen away or or do not want to kind of become involved in any any way with the faith. And I think this this um, um, you know story here that you had about Mother Angelica. I think that that's a fantastic example of. It wasn't kind of outsiders, right? Out people outside the Catholic faith that were, you know, you know, in disagreement with her. It was people inside. It was bishops. These are high-ranking people. But she didn't say, you know what? I'm going to leave all of this. I'm going to go off on my own. I'm going to, you know, try something else because this isn't working, um, and I'm leaving this. No, she didn't. She stayed and she fought for it because mm, God yeah. doesn't belong to them. God belongs to the people that love him and to the people that know that they are fighting for him and not fighting for, you know, whether it's recognition or fame or, or whatever it is or power. Um, do not be, I, do not be dissuaded. Do not be put off by the people, the, the flawed, extremely flawed human beings that are, that make up this family, that make up this church. In no way do I say that they should be let off the hook. That's not what I'm saying. The, the, these, these people who have been involved in these, um, these terrible crimes. Um, but for people looking in or, or that have fall, fallen away, God does not belong. I, I want to tell them that God does not belong to those, to those people. So, you know, I just wanted to make that, that point. Um, but yes, coming to the UN. Okay, so, so it's very interesting. I mean, there's, you know... So, I mean, the United Nations, of course, is, is in almost every, every country, is in every country. Um, and you have a, you know, you have people that are just like you said, I've come across people that are definitely people of faith. But once you get inside those kind of, you know, very important offices or, you know, maybe I should say very self-important offices, or you're inside those boardrooms and things like that, it's like, oh, no, 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 no. This is definitely not an environment conducive um, to, to talk about anything to do with religion. Right from the get-go, I, I, I quickly, I mean, through the course of every day, I think, I will make something, a remark that's related to probably to faith or to religion or something, even if I'm making a quip in some way. And I remember one of the first times I did, <laughs> I did it, I, I was working for the World Food Program back back then. Um, and it's so funny, it's a, a fantastic people in the World Food Program. And of course, you know, those that, mm, you know, that aren't maybe 
as great all the time. Um, but I, I mentioned something about faith and how, you know, I, I probably said we have to pray for this more than anything else. There had been a volcanic eruption in Vanuatu that we were um, supposed to be responding to within 24 hours because the island was where it had happened. Um, it was raining ash um, on this island. And I remember saying, you know, yeah, we're going to do this, 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 and this. Great. And you know what, guys? We really, I think we got to pray. We got to pray for this island. And I just remember everybody <laughs> laughing so loud, right? They threw their heads back and they're like, oh, thank you for, thank you for breaking the, um, just the tension in the room, Sonia, and stuff like this. I was like, yeah, no, 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 no. I wasn't breaking the tension. I'm actually deadly serious. <laughs> and one of, oh my God, what, it was just, you know, Oh, it was the funniest thing. One of the guys in the room, he's like, you're not serious, are you? I was like, oh, yeah, no, no, I, I, I was dead serious. And he was like, you're going to pray. Oh, my God. I just thought that that was, you know, it was so telling. And, and I, <laughs> anyway, that was one of, um, of several occasions. And that one was. Huge. And you know what? It is the most human thing to do. You, you know that saying that there are no atheists in the trenches, that even the most hardened atheists who despise religion, once the bullets are whizzing over the head, that's when the atheists disappear in the trenches. But um, I can imagine that boardroom setting. It's just funny. But I think, again, when they go secretly, they think, wow, Sanya, like what's going on there? You know, she's young, she's beautiful and she stands for something that there's something attractive about that. She stands for something and she's not afraid to say it, even if we all have a giggle. Like, you know, people go away and, and they admire you for that 100%. You know, Colin, um, I, I, I really appreciate you saying that. And, it, and, it's, and it's very telling of um, perhaps your character and, and, and for the majority maybe of people. Um, but that wasn't the case. This actually, it, 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 it escalated and, uh, and, and this person wasn't happy and told somebody higher up who who told somebody higher up who then told somebody higher up um and 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 the person and I was very new to the to to the UN at that time um and so I guess that's one way to make yourself known right so so <laughs> so, so <laughs> this person way higher up than I even knew that I could talk to um was like hey Sonia could I have a chat with you for a minute I was like, yes, sure. Oh, my God. You want to talk to me? Oh, sure. So I went in very, you know, very chirpy thinking, wow, you know, I must be doing something right here. <laughs> I go in. He's like, hey, Sonia. Um, and they're like, Sonia, the volcano. What did you pray about? The volcano <laughs> stops spewing ashes and lava. And people are saved, Sonia. You're now the head of the UN. Says to me, hi, Sonia. Um, listen, <laughs> you know, this is a bit of an uncomfortable conversation. But some people in the office um, are a little bit uncomfortable about some of the comments that you make. You know, it's this really cringy oh. UN talk, right? For could you just please shut up and never mention yeah, that yeah, again? I can hear that whisper. I can hear the whispered tones. And this is an uncomfortable conversation to have. Okay, well, then let's not have yes, it. Okay, exactly. perfect. I'll see you later. Exactly. Have a good day. You know what? I'm fine not having this then. Um, and, you know, when they start off, when he started off saying this is an uncomfortable conversation, it never occurred to me that it was going to be about that. I was like, oh, no, what is this about? <laughs> and then he says this and, and he goes, you know, of course, this is the United Nations and we respect all backgrounds and all faiths and, and everything, you know. And, and he said it's just that it's made some people a little bit uncomfortable here, you know, you mentioning this sort of thing. And I was like, oh, oh no, you're kidding me. I, I, I said that I'd, I'd have a think about it. I said, I, I can't promise I'll stop, but I'll have a think about it. And then I just never stopped. And uh, the others, I guess, just had to get used to it, right? Do you know what, Sanya? That is a genius answer. And I always tell people in meetings at networks and all that, when they bring you in for a meeting, the bosses, and they're talking absolute nonsense sometimes, never agree. Just say, you know what? Let me think about that. And nine out of 10 times, they never get back to you about it because they're just covering their own backsides because someone has asked them, they've went in and said, I'm very offended because Cullum said this and he expressed faith or Sanya said that. So they're kind of obliged to say to you. And all you have to do is say, you know what? 
Let me think about that. That's let me think about that, <laughs> and then just、that、disappear into、so、the night. That is so true. <laughs> that is so true, and and that's exactly how it was. And unfortunately,、um, there have been that wasn't the first incident, you know, and 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 other incidents were a lot more hostile than that, unfortunately.、Um, but you know, hey, listen, if I give up with just a couple of people being offended, come on. You know, Jordan Peterson said when he went viral for the first time, when he was asked by the host, "You know what you're saying is offensive, and why do you have the right to offend?" And he said, "Well, in order to be able to think, you have to risk being offensive." And then he said to the journalist, "Look at this. You're grilling me. You're certainly willing to risk offending me in the pursuit of truth." And more power to you. You should be allowed to do that. I mean, if we all have to walk around in eggshells and have to think about every sentence we say in case it may offend someone or may not offend someone, I mean, we just wouldn't be able to open our mouths. But it's funny that a place that you know says that it has such religious freedom and tolerance, when it comes down to it, and that's put into practice. It's like tolerance to an extent, or we're very tolerant as long as you believe in what we believe in, and yeah, we have religious freedom, but just never utter a word about religion or don't practice your faith at all in here.、Um, and I don't think it's uniform across the religions. You know, if if someone had said something like if a Hasidic Jewish person was in that boardroom and they had said something connected to their faith, or if a Muslim had said something connected to Allah or the Quran, you can. You can be sure they would never be pulled into a meeting and be asked not to do that again. There would be outrage. They'd be, they'd be anti-Semitic. They'd be anti-Muslim. It would just would not happen. You know, just to finish on on that topic, though, what what can be unfortunate, and like I like I mentioned at the beginning, you know, I've met incredible people with you know from all、um, you know backgrounds、um, of of faith and and religion who do. Who are very religious? Who go whether, like you said, you know, on Fridays to the mosque or or to church, you know, to mass every day from work and things like that, you know, that the issue isn't there. The issue is about being able to utter a word about it at the office, right? And and what was al- what is alarming in、mm. in some settings、mm-hmm. is that I have seen people very、um, senior. Up and and I,、uh, this is definitely you know not just within the UN. It's it's across you know boardrooms and organizations across the world. But I have been in meetings with you know thirty or forty people, and and you know you have some of the most senior people just m- making completely inappropriate jokes related to religion or related to faith, and people laugh. Even people that are very、oh. uncomfortable, you know, with it. Of course. Yeah. One hundred percent. I've had those jokes too in different networks I've worked in. People have said horrible things about priests, Catholics, and that would never. Those people would never be pulled up in a in a management office and would never be penalised. It's、um, not a level playing field. But like you said, look, things go in cycles and they change. But I know we're running out of time, and it's late in Fiji. It's early here in Rome, so I don't want to keep you too much longer because. You've got to hit the hay and get that beauty sleep. <laughs>、yes. I know that. <laughs> and I want to ask you quickly: your work with the UN has been varied. You mentioned the World Food、uh, Program, which is based the headquarters here in Rome, but you also have worked with a, a lot of environmental issues. And something we never even got to talk to: your work with the Marshall Islands about the nuclear、uh, cleanup that's happening there, or, or the maybe lack of nuclear cleanup after the. U.S. testing their nuclear weapons years years ago. So, what are you working on right now, and what are you passionate about? So, what I'm working on right now,、um, the I'd say the two big ones currently、um, within the United Nations. Of course, we we are、um, you know kind of trying to to pull ourselves out of the economic、um, blow that that the Pacific received. Uh, due to COVID nineteen, so Fiji and and many other Pacific islands、uh, rely very heavily on on tourism, very tourism dependent.、Um, and once the borders shut, that was that was the end of tourism, right? And it plunged. I mean, overnight in Fiji, I, I remember over maybe the course of two or three days, it plunged about twenty five thousand people into unemployment, and the numbers just kept. Going up from there. Now, it 
you know, the, the, the scene that it created over here um, was, it was so dire. The, the country's never experienced something like that before. Not only do you have the people that work on the national aircraft affected, right? So you have pilots let off, you have flight attendants let off, you have airport personnel let off, you have the security guards let off. Then you have all the taxi drivers that uh, wait outside the airport now without jobs. Move over to the hotels or all the hotel staff, you know, let off. I mean, hotels completely shut. Um, and then you ha- and we have, you know, all the major hotels here. So really large resorts of, you know, Hilton, um, the, the Intercontinental, like really big things over here. All of these staff let go. And it was so chaotic, so bad for the first time ever. So thousands of families were plunged into poverty. And with together with that, they were grappling with this pandemic. At one point in Fiji, we reached the highest number, the highest rate of infection in the world. We're talking about rate of infection. So the rate it was spreading, we surpassed India. Anyway, the Secretary General uh, was able to pool a very large fund of money called the COVID-19 Response Fund. I am one of the many people that work under that fund um, for a project that covers Fiji, uh, Tonga, Vanuatu and Palau, all countries in the Pacific. And we call it the Informal Economies Recovery Project. And we've been working uh, on that for about the last uh, year or so. Um, And we target things that people don't think of. So creative industries for one. So all the performers the fire dances, the, these are the interesting parts of the work, the fire dances, the, the cultural and crafts people that, would, that work and are dependent on the tourism industry. Thank God, a lot of success. Whoa, 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 you also, can't say that. You can't say yeah, that, Sanya. No, you can't exactly. say thank God. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to pull you up on that now. You've offended me. You've offended the listeners. I know. I, I don't know. bring God into this. You said thank God. I don't care about any of the good work you're doing. You have offended me. I am triggered. You're cancelled. I'm tweeting about you. You're the worst human being on the face of this planet. Please go ahead. Luckily for me, uh, the team that work on this project are, I I believe, all people of faith. And also, luckily, um, Antonio Guterres, the secretary general of the UN. I mean, he's the the former prime minister of Portugal, um, a very devout Catholic. And uh, I think you know, talk about a big shock. I mean, I I think it was the beginning of this year or late last year. He described, you know, um, climate, the, you know, the the climate change, COVID, conflict. He said, and and there was one more that I can't remember at the moment, but he said these were the four uh, horsemen of the apocalypse coming. But um, anyway, yes, so that's, so that's one, um, of, of the projects that we're working on at, at the UN at the moment. Um, and of course, the other one is with the incredible uh, government of the Marshall Islands. So once again, perhaps a country that maybe not everybody has heard of, located in the North Pacific. Um, and, and many might know the, the, the country Um, in the United States because, uh, of course, it was the testing grounds in the 40s and 50s for um, the United States nuclear testing grounds. Um, Very, 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 very sad history. Um, Over the last 76 years, and and, and that could be another podcast episode in itself, but the about two years ago, the government of the Marshall Islands, who are also, oh my God, really leading also at COP26 at the moment. They are the leaders of this, um, of, of this coalition of, of countries that are doing fantastic work at the negotiations there. Um, at the same time, though, the Marshall Islands are contending with this horrific, the horrific um, and continuing effects of this nuclear testing. And about two and a half years ago, they set up something called the National Nuclear Commission, uh, which is whom I I currently work with 
And to do a small bit of history, so during the 40s and the 50s, they tested a lot of atomic bombs and weapons here to find out what the effects of the weapons would be. Uh, huge craters left in the ground, I know they're at the Marshall Islands, but also, like Chernobyl and the exclusion zone, there's a lot of radioactivity still left there today. And I know when we spoke before this interview, you were saying that, I can't remember the statistic, how many people there are still today are, are born not with cancer or develop cancer? What's the statistic? You know, I, I don't have the exact percentage, but what I was discussing with, with colleagues at work at the commission is that, you know, about almost every second, it, oh, every second, almost every second person um, has either has cancer or has an immediate family member that develops cancer through the course of life. And the other thing that you mentioned, and I googled it afterwards, because I'd never heard of the expression before, was the term the translucent babies. Am I saying that right? The jelly babies. The jelly babies. Explain to me what a jelly baby is. Yeah, so the, you know, it was also the, the very first time that I had ever heard of this term. And, and it was remarkable because at at university I, I had studied medical sciences and um, so you know they said to me just in the course of conversation some of my colleagues said yes and one of the effects are is, are these jelly babies I said excuse me and basically what the, these poor babies that are born either either prematurely or at full term. And if you Google them, you'll see you'll see images, and they the skin is completely translucent, um, and they're born without bones or with not the complete skeletal structure, um, and they die within usually the day within twenty four hours or so. And it is it's been tied back. It's a direct direct consequence of the nuclear testing. Of the radiation. So to bring it forward to today, because again, we could discuss this for a whole other podcast because it's just, a, it's a fascinating, it's a terribly sad uh, history. So the United States did their nuclear testing there. Of course, they do not do that anymore, although I believe they still have a presence there. They still have bases on the Marshall Islands. But who is paying for the cleanup? Who is helping to still today to clean up the radiation? And is that what you are working on now to get more funds and more awareness? Yeah. And, and, and that's, you know, it, around here, around this point in the conversation is, is where apparently it's always been become sensitive and become very difficult to push forward. Now, back in the 70s, there was um, a cleanup attempt or a cleanup of sorts where local Marshallese who are now known in the country as the veterans, they're still alive. All of them have cancer the, of the ones that are still alive. These veterans were employed by the United States to gather basically as much of the larger debris and soil um, and other detritus that they could put it into this concrete underground tomb called the Runnet Dome, which was then sealed um, with a concrete lid. So if you Google the Marshall Islands, almost immediately you'll see um, a photograph of this concrete tomb. And it's supposed to, um, you know, hold. It's supposed to be holding. It is holding um, a lot, a vast amount of nuclear waste. But I was told that in comparison to what is outside the dome, it's only holding 1%. Since then, there haven't been any major cleanups. And that is something that the, that the Nuclear Commission is, is something that is really pushing for and trying to work with the new Biden administration um, to, to try to push for. Isn't it crazy that these administrations come in? I mean, I know this is common in governments across the world, and we are... You know, we're, we're noble people. We have to do the right thing for our people. We have to be fair to everyone. And like, it's as clear as day. The United States dropped so many atomic weapons to test them in the Marshall Islands in the 40s and the 50s, like not hundreds of years ago. And the radiation is still lingering there today. It is still causing cancer. Every scientist will tell you that. And then yet they don't want to own up to it 
and come over and clean it up and pay the compensation they have to to pay. So that's what you're working on at the moment with the Marshall Islands government. That's that's correct. So so that's something that that we're working on currently, and um, and and another ask that 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 the National Nuclear Commission has something that they really want from the government of the United States are all of these records, medical records, and also other records. Um, the United States did testing over the course of the last ten, uh, sorry, over the last couple of decades at various points. Um, where they they tested things like you know for the the amount of radiation in different parts of the island, but they also have um, medical records and and things that they um, have of people that you know they looked into of, of people that were affected, um, and the and the results on the human body and things. And I and I, if I'm getting this right, the Marshall Islands does not have has not received all of that information. Sanya, it has been a pleasure talking to you. I have learned so much about the Fiji Islands that I did not know about the history of it and uh, your fascinating family story about your <laughs> mafiosa's <laughs> grandfather. <laughs> you moved to Fiji and then learning about you and the United Nations and your faith and the work you do today. Uh, thank you so much for your time because I know we took an hour to set this up with the technical things and we've been chatting for well over an hour now as well. So thank you. Are you happy with that? Thank you. Thank you so much, Colm, and thank you um, for having me on. It was, it was great. This was a fantastic Thursday night. Ah, it was a nice Thursday night. Thursday morning for me, but Thursday night for you. Thank you so much. Sanya Ruggiero, everybody. And if you want to check her out, she's on Twitter and social media. You can keep tabs on what she's doing and all the uh, great projects that she's involved in. Wonderful person, really successful person in the field that she's in. And it was a privilege to be able to talk to her for this podcast. That is it for this episode. Please uh, share this online with your friends. And I'll be back soon with another episode of the podcast. So in the meantime, take care. And I'm going to leave you with a piece of music. This is from an Irish singer called Julie Feeney. It's a few years old, but it's a beautiful song. It is called Impossibly Beautiful.